All right, in the last part of this lecture, we will speak about autoencoders. Autoencoders are deep learning structures, so they are neural network architectures that are also supposed to find low dimensional representations of the data or low dimensional manifolds of given data set. And you can think about them as deep learning versions of principal component analysis. And we can actually substantiate this claim by looking at the loss function and seeing how it compares to the PCA loss function. First of all, let us look at the neural network architecture. So this is a, a, a using multi-layer perceptrons as elements of the autoencoder layers. And what you see here is that the input and the auto output dimension are equal. So the autoencoder takes data with a certain input dimension, then transforms it and outputs data with the same dimension as the input. So we can compare the input and the output directly to each other. But in between, the autoencoder goes through a so-called latent space or hidden space. And this latent space has a smaller dimension. So the autoencoder performs a dimension reduction by going from a large to a small dimension and then reconstructs from the small to the large dimension again. The first part of the autoencoder that projects or, or uh, transforms from the large input dimension to the small latent dimension is called encoder and the second part is called decoder. The loss function of the autoencoder is minimizing the reconstruction loss. So you can see it in the bottom of the slide. So you take the original data set. If you, if you look at the full data matrix, that is X. So X could also be a batch of data. And then we compare this original data set, X, which is used at the input, with the decoded encoded X. So you take X, put it through the encoder, put the result through the decoder again, and you compare that with the original X. Then you compute the Frobenius norm of this error and you minimize it. Yeah, you can also write this as a sum over individual time steps or data points, i from 1 to t, and then you minimize the reconstruction error for every single data point, so you minimize the Euclidean norm of the original data point minus d of e of the original data point. All right, so before we have shown that PCA minimizes such a reconstruction error, and now in the autoencoder we have a neural network structure which minimizes the same um, a reconstruction error. But we can go a little bit deeper with our comparison. So suppose that as encoder E and as decoder D we don't use neural networks, but we actually use linear functions. Or in other words, we just use matrices for E and for D. So the E matrix is just projecting our n-dimensional input to a m-dimensional latent representation, and the decoder is again lifting the m-dimensional latent representation to an n-dimensional output. And then encoding and decoding can just be written as matrix vector operations, as shown here. Then the minimization problem performed by training an autoencoder simply becomes, as shown here, you sum over all data points and you minimize the two norm of the data point minus d times e times the data point. And this is a very familiar form. If you go back to the PCA slides, and there you see, you see if you choose the encoder equals to WM, so the M first principal components of the data set, and the decoder, the, the WM matrix transposed, then we have the optimal solution. This is something we have shown for PCA. And then the linear autoencoder is identical to PCA. So in other words, if we train an autoencoder and if we use linear functions for the encoding and the decoding steps and we optimize them, then we obtain an equivalent result as PCA. Of course, one thing we have not done here when we just minimize this error is we have not enforced the individual vectors in Wm or E and D to be orthogonal to each other. We have not enforced that. And because of that, it will not automatically happen. What, what will happen is that 
e, uh, d multiplied with e describes a projection and a lifting that results in a small error. And it can even be equal to the error that we obtain with the optimal linear projection, wm, but it doesn't necessarily need to be the same matrix. So in other words, if we train d and e without additional constraints, we can find d and e such that the matrix product d, e, is equal to the matrix product wm, wm transpose, but e is not necessarily equal to wm and d is not necessarily equal to wm transpose. But of course the outer encoder is usually used in cases where we have no linear e and d but nonlinear e and d encoders and decoders and then we can think of the outer encoder to perform a nonlinear version of PCA. Here you see a comparison between outer encoders, non, so nonlinear neural network outer encoders, and PCA on the MNIST data set. On top you see the real data. In the second row you see a 30-dimensional deep outer encoder, and then uh, different versions of principal component analysis with the same number of dimensions. And you can see here that the outer encoder does much better with the same number of dimensions than PCA. And the reason for this is simply because we don't have the restriction of using a linear transformation for the encoder and the decoder step. So we can use more powerful functions to describe, for example, um, curvature or nonlinear elements of the data. Now in the last part, I want to speak about different neural network architectures, for example, convolutional neural networks. Yeah, we have seen convolutional neural networks in the last lecture and we have seen that they are much powerful than multilayer perceptrons for processing images. Now the task here for autoencoders is to start with a certain input dimension, go to a lower latent space dimension and then go back to the input dimension. It's pretty clear how to do this with multilayer perceptrons. It's also pretty clear how to realize an encoder with convolutional neural networks because convolutions will either retain the dimension if we use zero padding, they will reduce the dimension if we use a valid padding and of course if we use pooling or striding we also reduce the dimension. So reducing the dimension is not a problem with convolutional neural networks. But how do we implement a decoder? How do we do convolutions that go back to higher dimensional images? And so, of course, one important component of that is how to undo pooling. But in this lecture, I just want to con um, uh, discuss how to do something like an inverse or a transposed convolution. Yeah, so if we do a forward convolution with valid padding, we lose some dimensionality because we lose something at the boundary, how can we do something like the inverse of that? And for that let us look again at how convolution is defined. We have seen that we can write convolution and now uh, for the moment ignore the, the nonlinear activation function. We can write the convolution operation itself as a linear matrix vector product where the weight matrix has this special form that we share the parameters across the rows, this so-called Töplitz matrix, which has the convolutional kernel weights written in each row, but they are shifted with respect to one another in the different rows because the convolution operation is shifting the kernel with respect to the image. And if we, if we use valid padding, we reduce the dimension by, by this operation because in this case the W matrix is not a square matrix, it's a rectangular matrix that has less rows than columns. And now the straightforward operation to do something like inverting or reverting the effect of a convolution is a transposed convolution. So for that we again define a linear operation where we take X as an input from the last layer we multiply it with a weight matrix to obtain y, and we will, of course, again use a nonlinearity after this. So we will apply a nonlinear transformation of the results. But the convolution itself is just defined as something with a transposed weight matrix. And by transposed, we mean 
a weight matrix which is again rectangular but in a different way where we have more rows than columns and we have parameter sharing in the columns instead of the rows. So we can implement the convolution by writing it or we can implement the transpose convolution by writing it as a linear operation and then multiplying the vector x with the transpose of the weight matrix. But in practice, convolutions are not implemented this way. So convolutions are not implemented by writing out the turbulence matrix, storing it, and actually doing the matrix vector multiplication. And the reason for that it, is it would be very inefficient to do that. Uh, at least if we, if we use a dense matrix vector operation, that would be really inefficient because we would have to store a large matrix with a lot of zeros. And we would have to compute all these uh, matrix uh, uh, vector um, elementary products. So, so we have to compute a lot of products of pairs of numbers where one of them is actually zero and that's a waste. So we actually prefer to implement it directly. We implement convolution directly as a sparse matrix vector product. So we only take products over pairs of numbers that are not zero. So we can assume that in an in a implementation, in an efficient neural network implementation, we will not have dense matrix vector products, but we will have just some function to compute the convolution efficiently. So then the question becomes, how can we hijack that function in order to implement the transposed convolution efficiently too? And it turns out we don't need to rewrite that, we can actually use the same function. And here is how. So for that look, look again at the forward and the backward pass of a dense neural network operation. So symbols, again, W is the weight matrix, XL is the neural output activation at layer L, sigma is the nonlinear activation function, which is applied element-wise to every element of the vector it receives as an input, and CL are these neural network activations before applying the nonlinearity. So this is after the linear and before the nonlinear step. And here we go back to the backpropagation lecture where we have looked at the forward and the backward pass. So the forward pass is, and now we just assume that the bias vector is zero to just make the expressions look a little bit simpler, but the same will work with bias non equal zero. So for bias equal zero, um, we have the linear operation as follows, we have the activations from the last layer or the current layer XL, we apply the next weight matrix WL plus one, and we obtain the next activations before the nonlinearity ZL plus one. And then we apply the nonlinear activation function sigma and obtain the outputs of the neurons in the next layer XL plus one. That is the forward pass. And let's say we have an implementation for that an efficient implementation and also an efficient implementation for convolutions, so where W has the special structure of the turbulence matrix. Now let's look at what the backward pass does for the same parameters. So this again uses this so-called error vector, which is basically the sensitivity of how much does the output of the neural network change if we change individual uh, Z elements, so individual activations of the neurons before the nonlinearity. And this was a quantity we needed in order to compute, uh, so first of all to backpropagate the gradient information through the neural network and eventually to compute the derivatives of the loss function with respect to individual parameters so that we can implement the parameter update step in the training procedure. Right? So this, these error vectors are quantities that we compute routinely as part of the backpropagation step in a neural network. And here again are the equations of, of this error vector. So how this error vector is actually computed given the current activations of the neural network z, the, the, the next error vector, so the error vector of the next layer, and the weights. And what you see here is you, if you write this as a matrix vector product in the last line of uh, the last equation here, then you see the transpose of the weight matrix L plus 1 comes into play here. 
So you see in the implementation of the backward pass, we do something like the forward pass, but with the transpose of the weight matrix. And the difference is then also that instead of applying the weight matrix to X, to the neural network inputs, we apply the transposed weight matrix to E, so to the error vector. But so the bottom line is, if we have an efficient implementation for convolutions for doing the forward pass and the backward pass for convolutional, convolutional neural network layers, then we can use the same implementation to implement transposed convolutions and we just need to exchange the functions for the backward and the forward pass. So this is just a technical trick, but these technical tricks are quite handy. All right, so we are at the end of this lecture. We have introduced into unsupervised learning and specifically into manifold learning. So we have asked ourselves, how can we reduce the dimension of a given data set efficiently, so in a way that we don't destroy too much information or we maximize our ability to reconstruct the data after bringing it down to a low dimension. And we have studied different algorithms to do that. The principal component analysis, which is a shallow machine learning algorithm. And we have seen there, there are two different ways of training PCA or two different views of what PCA optimizes and that turned out to be equivalent. That is on one hand, maximizing the variance of the data after projecting it to a lower dimensional space. On the other hand, it is minimizing the reconstruction error, so minimizing the difference between the original data and the original data projected to the low dimensional space and lifted back up to the high dimensional space. And we have seen that one of these loss functions, so the minimization of the reconstruction error, can also be used in a deep neural network setting, so where we use an encoder and a decoder network that goes to a lower dimensional latent space and back up to a high dimensional original space. This is an autoencoder then, and if we minimize the reconstruction error, we can basically do a nonlinear version of PCA, and we can even show that if we use linear neural networks, so just essentially matrices and train them with backpropagation and this loss function, we would um, we would recover PCA or we would, would recover a projection operation that projects into the same space as PCA and is able to, to recover the same reconstruction error, they obtain the same reconstruction error. And in this spirit, um, we will continue in the next lecture. So we will continue to look at shallow machine learning algorithms where it's easy to understand what the loss functions actually do, what they optimize, what other things are equivalent to certain loss functions. And we will use this in order to get a motivation to define loss functions for deep neural networks in the setting of doing unsupervised learning. With this, thank you for your attention and see you in the next lecture.